One final task that we want to take a look at that may not be entirely obvious has to do with the reliance of Active Directory on your DNS infrastructure. Recall that in this infrastructure, my server bighit.specialized.net is the DNS server that is currently servicing both of these domains, Specialized and the company domain as well. So let's actually remote over to that server, uh, bighit.specialized.net, and then take a look at the DNS uh, console over here so that we can take a look at the types of records that have been added to DNS as we go about adding an, uh, an Active Directory domain controller. When you create an Active Directory domain controller, one of the things that it does is to create a whole bunch of different records here inside of your zone. I'll take a look at forward lookup zones here and look at company.pri. And you can see these four little subzones that exist down here. And inside these subzones are a whole bunch of additional configurations. In fact, they go relatively deep here for sites and site services and all this different stuff. Each of these has to do with machines on the network that need to contact Active Directory services, the variety of Active Directory services out there, it gives those machines a way of locating where those services exist. And it accomplishes that through the use of DNS SRV records. These SRV records you've probably played with before in some of the previous exam content, or at least you've seen them if you've played with any Windows DNS server in the past. An SRV uh, record is essentially like a traditional A record, except it goes hand in hand with an A record in that it not only identifies the server where a, a service exists, but what service exists on that server. So in the case of sites, for example, here in our DEN site, our users or our machines, when they need to go find, for example, the Kerberos service, they know that when they're in that site, they can go to DEN DC1 DEN DC2, or DC, because that server is currently in this site. If they're in the Las Vegas site, well, then they're going to find it over here. So there's TCP, and in fact, in order to find it, there's the Kerberos uh, service record for the Las Vegas site. Clients will know, as a function of the logon process, which site they're in, and so they can use that information to help them locate the closest proximity services that they need for future authentication requests. Now, one of the things that you just, it, you will, again, you might not ever do this in reality, but it's nice to know for the exam, is recognizing when these SRV records are perhaps not best configured for the, the actuality, the actual configuration of your network environment. Let's go back over here to DEN, for example, and we can take a look at the three, really the two, since we're kind of ignoring the server DC, the two different servers that we're working with, DEN DC1 and DEN DC2. Let's assume, for example, that I had a bunch of money at some point in the past, and then after that I didn't quite have as much money. And so I've purchased two servers, one of which is extremely powerful, and the other one is perhaps not so powerful. Right now, the configuration of these two services is set up to provide equal weighting here for users or for, for computers that are attempting to ask for authentication to these services. When a computer attempts to go in and ask Kerberos for services, it's going to go equally to this record, uh, DEN-Sites, that's associated with DEN-DC1, as it is over here with DEN-DC2. You see the weighting is the same between the two. I bring this up because occasionally you might in this this dissimilar hardware circumstance, want to adjust the weighting so that the second server only gets contacted when the first server is not available. This gives you the ability to kind of just fine tune how clients are going to connect up with multiple different domain controllers for different services that exist in the same site. The other SRV record sort of cheat that I want to show you has to do with the inadvertent deletion or destruction of data that can exist here in the DNS console. As you can see here, as I kind of flip through all these different records, there's a, there's a bunch of content here. There's all kinds of stuff that's required in order for an Active Directory domain to function. Many, many different uh, subdomains and all the content that exists in those subdomains. I think I counted it one time many years ago that for a single domain controller and a single domain, it was something like 20-ish or so different DNS records and subzones that were required to be in place, and every one of them had to be correct. Well, you can go about logging what those are, you know, documenting them for your documentation purposes, but there's one really quick command that you're already aware of that can, be in, it can come in handy should you ever accidentally lose some DNS data on a particular, uh, for a particular domain controller. If I bring up a command prompt here, you're probably familiar with the command ipconfig register DNS. That command will, uh, if, you, well, if you do it with elevation, that command will register this server's DNS records into DNS. 
The great part about Microsoft DNS and the DNS client that exists on domain controllers is that running this IP config register DNS command on a domain controller will automatically register not only the domain controller's A records, but all of the associated SRV records that make it a domain controller or resolvable as a domain controller. So if you're having problems finding your DCs, it's always a good idea to come back here to run an IP config register DNS to see if you can just get that domain controller to automatically register where it happens to be back with your DNS infrastructure.